Futures and Fundraising is presented by Alexander Hess. Alexander Hess, transforming institutions that transform lives. Welcome to Futures in Fundraising. I'm David King, president of Alexander Haas, your host for Futures in Fundraising. Today, our guest is Peter Panepinto. He is the philanthropic practice leader for Turn2 Communications and author of Modern Media Relations for Nonprofits. I have the printout page here, Peter, because I bought the book in digital format. I've not actually bought a paper book in quite a long time, but here's (laughs) what it looks like. Peter, uh, prior to founding um, Turn2, Peter actually worked for 20 years in journalism, including a stint as a writer and then an editor at the Chronicle of Philanthropy. So he's very familiar with our marketplace um, here at Futures in Fundraising. And we wanted to talk to Peter some today about modern media relations for nonprofits. Um, Peter, thanks so much for joining us today. Really excited to, uh, to be here and for the invitation. I wanted to start with... Uh, this is how we sort of go. The title of the podcast is Futures in Fundraising, but we seem to always start in the past and work our way forward. Um, so I wanted to start and ask you a question. I mean, you've been in media relations for more than two decades here. How has media relations changed in the 20 years since you started as a journalist? Sure. It's it's changed quite a bit. And I think if, if, if you think about how your own media habits have changed over even the last 10 years, um, the change is pretty dramatic. When I started out in the field, and, and really we're going on 25 years ago now right. because of, of the time I've had outside of journalism, uh, I started my professional career in 93. And at that time, we were actually manually pasting up pages to uh, the weekly newspaper I worked at. Um, and you know everything was very print driven. There was a big news hole. There were big reporting staff. So it was really kind of a completely different era of media. Uh, and in that short 25 years, everything's been completely turned upside down. Uh, we've seen the explosion of online media. We've seen uh, a lot of um, of cuts and, and changes in reporting staffs. And, and uh, we actually don't see as many reporters even covering nonprofits and philanthropy as a beat anymore. So uh, for those of us who now work in the nonprofit world and are trying to navigate that, it's, it's, it's quite different. I think we're competing, uh, you know, for a lot, we're competing a lot more for attention and we're, we're dealing with a lot of, of reporters and editors who don't have the same depth of knowledge that they may have had in the past. And I think even if, I think even when you were at the Chronicle Philanthropy, it was probably a weekly publication. And uh, now, we were every other week back then, but now it's, yeah, now it's monthly. Yeah. Now so. it's a monthly publication. So even talk about the time lag and it's kind of gone the opposite way of our news cycle, right? Our news cycle is by the minute, real time almost. Right. But the right. print publication is now, it's now a history publication as opposed to Well, it, the, the print publication is, but they've, uh, during the time that I was there, we went from, from really building um, our entire coverage around that print publication to really becoming a, a, a 24-7 online uh, site and social media site um, with, a, with a, a print publication that was kind of attached to it. It, it became... Uh, the, the whole model for it shifted from being very, you know, issue driven, you know, every other week issue driven to being, we've got to get the news out as it happens. And we, you know, we, we, we really have to feed that appetite first and then build a, a print magazine behind it. Yeah. So I want to, I want to turn to, to some of the book um, and ask you some questions about the, the book and the content in the book. So one of the sections of the book that really, that really, caught my eye when I was just looking at the table of contents and certainly when I was reading it is the section entitled, are you newsworthy? (laughs) Um, And one of the reasons that this caught my attention is because we often, we have clients who believe that they should send out a press release every time someone in the office sneezes, you know, it's, (laughs) and you know, we find ourselves in the position sometimes of having to, to be the person to say, you don't need to send out a press release about that. Nobody cares. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, how, I mean, that may be a little harsh on our part, but in sometimes, sometimes it's true. Tell us about that. Are you newsworthy? How you handle that in the book? And then how you deal with that with your own clients? Sure. Um, I think it's, it, 
get, getting back to even the, the current media climate now, I think the, the days of just sending a news release out every time you have something you feel like you have to say and expecting somebody to pick it up, uh, those days are pretty much over. It's a lot harder to get the media to pay attention to what you're talking about now. Um, so, you know, we really uh, advocate in the book uh, about really being thoughtful about when you make an announcement and and make taking steps to make sure that what you are actually pitching and pushing to reporters is something that um, is something that they're going to be really interested in. We really advocate for really taking a, the time to get to know what reporters are covering and what their outlets are covering and, and waiting for opportunities where your nonprofit may have something to say to them that fits on their beat and is likely to get their attention. Um, the other part of this is we are, are strong advocates for the relations word in media relations. And we, we strongly believe, and, and this bears out in a lot of the practice and, and the work that I do with our clients, is that rather than uh, just making it a, a kind of a push uh, relationship where you have, where you're putting out press releases every time your CEO sneezes, um, and, and really making yourself more available to reporters when they're looking for information from you, and, and, and positioning yourself as an expert and a source for them when they're reporting on a story or when they need expertise on something. Um, that does two things for you. One, it, it has them coming to you with the stories they're already working on, um, so you don't have to pitch them. Um, and two, um, it, it builds a lot of credibility with that reporter so that when you actually do have something that you think is newsworthy, um, they're going to pay attention to that pitch. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to come to them when they trust you um, and when they know that what you're actually bringing to them is something that they're likely to want to cover. Um, it's, what, it's almost like getting spammed. If you are putting something out all the time, uh, it starts to become part of the, the background noise. and the noise and they may not pay as much attention to it. So, I mean, do do people do news releases anymore? I mean, do people write press releases and send them places? Is that they do, and and it still happens quite a bit with nonprofits too. I think, and and it and it's almost like an item that they're checking off on their to do list. In a lot of cases, when you're planning an event or announcing something, it's like, oh, we got to put out a press release uh, along with this. Um, we view press releases a bit differently. It's they're they're certainly useful, and they are um, they're something that you attach to your cover note essentially to provide background information to put on your website if people are searching for information. But um, you know the days of uh, a fax machine being in the corner of a newsroom or kind of that teletype machine being there where the releases are coming out and some editor is sifting through them those days are pretty much over. Um, a lot of communication now is direct to a reporter via email, and it, you're almost better off doing a custom email to the reporters that you think are going to be more, most attentive to what you're, you're you know, to what you're actually talking about, um, and, and, and sending something a bit more informal but informed to them and attaching the press release to it and providing that as background. Another thing you touch on in the book, um is controlling your own sort of becoming your own media, you know, getting the information out through your own channels. Um, so talk some about that as, as a, as a vehicle um, and how that may or may not be more effective than writing press releases. Sure. And that's, that's really something that has, has really emerged in this last 10, 15 years where everybody has moved to having their own website and having their own social media channels. Really, every organization is essentially its own news agency now if it wants to be. Um, and what can be really helpful with that, especially if you have a blog, if you have a podcast, if you have a newsletter you're sending out to donors, is to really think about how to use those channels in ways where you're not just um, kind of selling your story, but you're providing insight and knowledge um, that is going to help bring, uh, bring in, you know, enlighten folks about your mission or the work you're doing, mm -hmm. and using some of that as ways to reach out to reporters too. Um, and, and that also helps complement what you are doing with your media outreach efforts. So if you are sharing some of your better writing, some of the content you're producing through your own channels with reporters, um, it, it is a way to, to get their attention. And it's also a way for you to show up when they're looking for information too, when they're actually out researching a story. So thinking about your own channels as part of your media relations effort and as a complementary piece of that can be very valuable to you. And I think, you know, I think as we work with clients, um, 
and we're not in the media relations area, but we are firm believers that that brand um, the brand supports fundraising activity. And Absolutely. we see so many organizations um, who still don't believe that social media is a legitimate marketing tool and and are, are maybe their boards don't believe it, but and are sort of sitting on the sidelines while all of this stuff happens around them, but they're not capitalizing on it. That's absolutely true. And I think especially if you're working in a, at a nonprofit that has a mission that is um, that, that there is some debate about the work you're doing, or there's, there's knowledge about the work you're doing. If you're not in social media, even if, even if it's not actively to promote the work you're doing, but at least to participate and monitor the conversations that are happening about the work you're doing, um, you're missing out with a, you know, missing out on a real channel and a real and a real place where people are actually engaged with the work you're doing. Yeah, your voice is absent from the discussion. Absolutely. The other thing that we find too is that increasingly, um, if you're searching on an issue or a specific organization, that you know some of the top search results you'll see will be social media activity. And if you're an organization that's you know a food bank or supporting homelessness or or whatever, and somebody in your community searches that topic, and you're not active in social media, your chances of showing up in those search results are diminished as well. That's absolutely true. You really have to think holistically about all of this and make sure that you you are being engaged where people are that care about the work you're doing. And social media is one of those places, I think regardless of your mission, where people are talking about the work you're doing, and in a lot of cases, talking about your specific organization. And if you're not part of that, um, you're not showing up, you're not, and, and you know, you're, you're not showing up when things, people are searching on Google, you're not showing up when people are searching conversations on social media, and you're not a- actually able to actively engage with people while you're there. Yeah, it's funny. We'll look at, sometimes we'll do a social media audit at the beginning of our engagement with a client just to see what they're doing, to see if they're, if they're branding at all. We don't do social media consulting. It's not our gig, but we want to know if they're doing anything. Um, and we'll sometimes go to a client's um, Facebook page or a LinkedIn group they've created and see the last post was, you know, nine months ago. And it's sort of like you better off deleting it than <laughs> having it like that. Right. Right. That's very true. That's very true. And, and you know, it, it, you, you're, yeah, you actually are better off not being there if you're not going to be there actively. But, um, but it, it's really important in, in all of these areas to be showing up and to be paying attention. And, and even if, even if you don't feel as though you're giving it all of your effort, you know, being strategic and making sure you're, you, you are being thoughtful about what you actually do is, is really crucial. Great. We're going to take a very short break. We'll be right back with more on Futures in Fundraising. What project am I most proud of? Well, I think all of them, to be honest, because they are all different. And that's one of the reasons I love working with Alexander Haas is there is no cookie cutter approach. All of our clients are different. I am particularly uh, mindful of the work that uh, we have done with Converse College uh, in helping them uh, with reorganizing their development program. But I was also extremely pleased with a very significant project we did with the American Libraries Association and the work I'm currently doing with Cotty College. All three of those very different, very unique, all with different rewards. I loved every single one of them. Welcome back to Futures in Fundraising. Our guest today is Peter Penapento, author of Modern Media Relations for Nonprofits. Peter, I wanted to ask you and, and go back to something we talked about in the last segment where you talked about um, about the relations part of media relations and and making friends with reporters, if you will, so that they view you as a trusted source and a resource and so that they're contacting you when they need content or when, they need, when they're working on a story. And I've been fortunate in, in my career to have had media relations training a few times and and sort of know how to deal with that. 
calls from reporters always seem to come sort of out of the blue. <laughs> they're either doing a story about your organization or they're doing a story about another organization in your sphere and they want you to comment on it or clarify or be an expert witness of sorts. Um, but they just, they kind of, the phone rings and you, you know, and there it is. What is your counsel to nonprofit executives in terms of how to deal with reporters when they get those kinds of calls? And I guess take it in two ways. One would be a reporter you have a relationship with, which would probably be the more comfortable. But I also get calls all the time from organizations that I've never heard of, and I don't know the reporter, but they're doing a story on higher education fundraising, or I've had a lot this year on the tax policy stuff. Right, right. Um, you know, and these are out of the blue, and I know how to deal with them, and but a lot of people don't. They've never had to do that. So how do you, what do you say about that in the book? Um, because I know you've got a section on it in the book. And then how do you counsel your clients to deal with it? Sure. And we do actually do a lot of work with with clients who are dealing with national media. And in a lot of those cases, even if we've built relationships, there are a lot of reporters that we don't know. When I talk to, to different people from the Chronicle of Philanthropy all the time. Right. Right. And and a lot of that, a, a lot of it is, is uh, trying to do your work up front on, uh, to get a sense of how the reporter covers things and, and finding out as much as you can about the story they're working on and the angle they're taking. Um, a lot of times if a reporter comes with an, uh, with an inquiry, I try to get as much information as I can from them up front. Some of them will, will be very open and say, you know, I'm working on a story on this. I kind of feel like it's going in this direction. Uh, but here are some of the big questions I have. Some of them are going to be a little bit more closed, or, you know, tight lipped with you because they, you know, they don't want to give things away to, to the sources that they're, they're working, working with, or they just don't know what the story is yet. Um, but the more information you can gather up front, and that includes finding out their deadline um, and, and knowing how quickly you need to respond to them and, and get somebody in front of them is, is really important. So I, I try to almost pre-interview the reporter before I even – uh, say, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get you the, the CEO or the executive director to speak with you. Uh, but once I get that information, I then, you know, kind of present what I know to the to the source themselves and, and prepare them for the kinds of questions that they might get, the kinds of, you know, any background I do have on that reporter, if I do know them, is, is really helpful too. Um, and, and just kind of brief them on that and then have a conversation about some of the, you know, some of the talking points that they've that they want to get across and that I might feel like they would want to try to get across. And maybe what they shouldn't say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What they should say and what they shouldn't say, or, you know, what to emphasize and what not to emphasize and, and also prepare them for what to do if they do get a tough question or something they don't want to answer. And in some cases it, the advice is, you know, maybe that, you know, I, you know, I don't feel comfortable answering that question, or I don't feel like I have enough information to answer that question, or even saying, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but here's somebody who does. And in a lot of cases, that allows you to pivot away from it a little bit, but also, you know, help the reporter out a little bit too, to, to get them where they need to go. Um, but it, you know, it's as much preparation as you can get. Um, and, and also just making sure that you're doing some coaching along the way before that inquiry comes in with with that um, with your director or, or CEO to kind of make them feel more comfortable with with the key points that they're likely to be talking about over time. I feel like when I get these calls, it's either my deadline is today or my <laughs> deadline is tomorrow, and I need to hear from you as soon as possible. Um, and I do find that um, that occasionally I will get a call from a reporter who's who's. They've, they've made up their mind what the story is, um, and and I'm giving them information that is contradictory to what they think the story is. Mm -hmm. So an example, I did an interview um, week before last with a with a writer from the Chronicle of Philanthropy, and, and the bent that they were trying to go with the story is that the tax law change is going to just kill fundraising because of the you know, that number of itemizers going down. And I happen to not believe that, I, you know, I may mm -hmm. be I may be a lone voice here in the wilderness. But but my point that I began to make with this reporter is um, there are statistics out there that say upwards of 90 percent of American households contribute to philanthropy. But, you know, before the tax law change, only a third of American households itemized. So those other 60 some odd percent weren't itemizing the deduction anyway. So to them, it you know, the tax change was a non issue. Right. And the other point I made was. You know, 
the tax, being able to write off a contribution just means you don't have to pay the tax on that little bit of money. You still don't have the money. <laughs> you know, the money's right. gone. Um, and, you, you know, you just don't get to write it off. You know, if you're not itemizing, you don't write it off. And that, that really the decision to give is a decision made almost entirely out of emotion. It has virtually nothing to do with tax policy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that I felt like people would continue to give and that there may be other elements of the tax law change that impact giving. Um, but that the loss of the standard deduction, I didn't think was going to have a big impact. Now, one of two things will happen. I know this from my experience. Either I convinced him of that and he'll quote me in the story as a counterpoint, or I was contrary to the point he was trying to make and he won't quote me at all. (laughs) Well, it really, it depends on the type of story and the type of outlet. I would imagine that you, even if the reporter has a lot of people saying that it's going to change, uh, giving practices, he, he's, he or she is going to want to have um, some tension in the story or some, you know, some different perspective in the story to, to provide that balance. And in a lot of, you know, uh, I think we, when we look at cable TV news now and kind of the, the partisan bent of that, we start to assume that everybody is, you know, getting moved into one camp or the right. other. But in, you know, in a lot of, in a lot of outlets, especially ones that cover a field like philanthropy, they are, there is a bit of nuance in the coverage and they are looking for the, you know, different, differing voices with differing perspectives. And it's important to be that, especially if you, um, if, if they're reporting on a topic where you have a different opinion than somebody else. And in this particular, this actually, that interview actually prompted me to write an article that's being reviewed now for Forbes about, and my take on the article was all of the economists are, have created these formulas that predict fundraising is going to go down. But the one thing that doesn't fit into their neat little mathematical formulas is the emotional part of giving. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no way to, you know, there's not a variable in there in the mathematics to make that happen. So there's an, an opportunity for you to take a, 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 an earned media opportunity and turn it into an own media opportunity too, right? And, and make it something, even if it doesn't end up in Forbes, you can use that somewhere else. Somewhere sure. else. We'll use it in a newsletter or somewhere. Um, right. So I wanted to, I want to pivot a little bit and get back to the book because one of the, the things, you've developed a process that you call the Great Approach to Media Relations, G-R-E-A-T. Um, and it's really an acronym. Um, without giving away the entire book... <laughs> Can you can you walk us through that process? Um, you know what each element of it is and how it's important, and, and just give us sort of an overview, I guess, of the process you lay out in the book. Sure, and 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 the great approach that we came up with is really a way to to help nonprofits that don't have a ton of resources for media relations to actually be Which is very most secure. of them. <laughs> yeah, which is most of most of the nonprofit sector, but we do feel like it, this is. A, there are elements of this that would appeal to anybody, even even the biggest national charity can can use these tactics in, in, in their own way. I but, think it even applies yeah. in the for profit sector. I mean, I read the book and I was like, yeah, this is great. We can use this. <laughs> great. I, I'm glad you think so. So um, but the idea is that we really want to help folks be very smart about the time they are investing in media relations. So the great approach is is a really a, a quick framework to think about that and, and the different parts of your strategy that you need to have to be able to to be really efficient and effective. So the the, the G in that is goal oriented and and we highly recommend that organizations before they even before they send out their next press release or before they sit down to to put together a media relations strategy really take a step back and and think about and articulate their organization's overarching goals what are you looking to what are the two or three big things you're looking to accomplish as an organization over the next year or two um, you know are you looking to you know, launch a new program? Are you looking to grow fundraising in a certain area? Are you looking to, to make progress on a certain issue? Really articulate those and make those the central place where you put your effort with your media relations. We've already talked about how important it is to not send a re- press release every time your executive director sneezes. Um, but that'll start to give you a sense of like, what are the topics and topic areas that you really want to focus on with your media relations effort? What are the things you actually want to push out to reporters? And what are are some of the key messages you want to get out there? Um, And we recommend really reviewing those every year. So that's the G. Uh, the, the R in, in great is responsive, and, and that gets back to the media relations, relations word that we talked about earlier. Um, 
responsive is really making sure you're equipping your nonprofit to not just be available to, to when when you want to put something out there, but but being able to respond to the needs of the reporter. And that's both when the reporter is coming to you looking for something, but also when you have something to announce. If you are looking to get coverage on a story and you put a news release out or an announcement out and you're not there to answer the reporter's phone call, um, no. you're not you're not doing yourself any good. You're not being responsive. And that also means keeping in mind that reporters, even and especially in today's world, aren't necessarily just working nine to five. Having somebody who's responsible after five o'clock or available after five o'clock to pick up their cell phone and, and, and be ready if there's a question. Would so, you also put under that umbrella the concept that that maybe if you you figure out which publications are the most important to you or even which publication is the most important to you and, and give some kind of exclusivity or advanced access to that absolutely. publication? I think that's a that's a really helpful tactic. And and actually, we'll get a little bit more to that when we get to T at the end. So, so yeah, you teed me up a little bit there. <laughs> Literally teed you up for the T. <laughs> So um, the E in great is empowered, and that is is really focused on making sure you understand um, your your rights and responsibilities with the media, knowing when you can ask for something, knowing that when something is wrong or you feel like something is 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 not being portrayed accurately in the media, mm -hmm. that you understand the tools you have in your toolbox to combat that and how you can work with reporters and how you can use your own channels to to um, to dispel things that that you know, you either don't um, don't agree with or you think are wrong in, in how folks are covering things. So and we provide a lot of really tactical advice on, on how to navigate those situations and what to do and, and, and really understanding how you can be empowered, um, you know, and, and, and raise your voice, even if you aren't called for that story or you feel like that story doesn't doesn't get it right. Um, the A in, in great is, uh, is appealing, and, and this is a piece that um, we haven't really talked about, you and I, yet, but it's, it's really important. It's making sure that um, you're not, um, that, that actually what you're presenting to reporters is something that is, is presented in, a, in an appealing package and, and gives them, um, you know, all of the information and key information they need quickly and accessibly making sure you have a media page on your website that actually includes contact information for, mm -hmm. for folks in your organization. Um, and, and also thinking about things like photos and videos and imagery that you can have on hand to provide to the media as, as a resource to complement their reporting. Um, one of the things now that a lot of news organizations are, are doing is they don't have the, the visual staff that they used to have. So if you're able to create appealing videos, infographics, photos, and have those available to reporters, um, you can actually almost get extra space in their stories and in their coverage by, by having some of those things available. Especially and the last so much content is going on, is going to either, it's going to either go online and in print or just online and, and graphics are, are necessary for online. Absolutely. Absolutely. So having some of those things on hand, if you're putting a report out or something new like that, really thinking about having some assets that you can pull out of that and make available to the media, it helps you not only get a leg up and, and actually getting coverage because reporters, as part of what they're doing now, they need to have those visuals. So you, the, the, the thing that might put you over the top and getting your story covered is having those and, and they're very valuable. Um, we keep going back to my old employers at the Chronicle, but they don't have a photo staff there. When I was a reporter there and an editor there, you know, we were getting a, a lot of the imagery for the stories from the nonprofits themselves. So if you have good imagery, um, if you have pictures of the work you're doing and, and key people and all those things ready to go, um, that can give you extra real estate <laughs> in that coverage. And it, and it could be the difference that gets your your CEO quoted or executive director quoted and somebody else not. So yeah, I'm on a deadline. They've given me all this, all of the, everything I need so I can package this up and get it out. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and T is targeted and it gets back to the point you just made about identifying a few of the, the key organizations, the news organizations that, that really kind of tie back to those goals at the beginning of this and, and really concentrating a lot of your effort on making sure that you're building relationships with some of those reporters and outlets that 
are likely to get the word out to the people you need to help reach your goals as an organization. So if you are looking, let's say you're a local nonprofit and you really need to reach the business community because that's where your donors are, that's where your supporters are, that's where a possible partner is, then maybe taking some time to build a relationship with a key reporter or an editor at the business journal in your town or at the yep. business section of the local newspaper and cultivating that and, and providing them with some exclusives and different things to get them in the door and, and really connecting with you. Um, that can really be the key to, to making sure that you're, it, it's not always so much about the number of stories you get placed or the number of times you get mentioned, but getting mentioned in the right places at the right time with the right message is, is really the key to all of this. Um, if you're a local nonprofit, a, a story in the New York Times or a pickup on the CBS News may not be as valuable to you as that story in your local newspaper. Right. And with the business journals particularly, you need to know what their publication schedules are because most of them are weeklies at best mm -hmm. and yeah. their deadlines are different. And if they publish on Wednesday and you come out with news on Thursday, by the time they publish again, it's not news and they're going to ignore you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's all things that you need to factor into the equation as you're as you're building out your strategy and, and really identifying who you want to go after. Um, so much of this isn't so much about um, promoting yourself, but it's really getting to know the outlets that you want to, so you want to connect with knowing how they work, what their deadlines are, what their pitching preferences are. Um, it takes a bit of legwork up front. Um, but if you are able to do that, or if you're, if you're fortunate enough to be able to work with an outside agency that can help you with that, it, it can save you so much time later and it can get you much better, um, much better placements and, and reach the people you want to reach more. Um, then, you know, kind of taking the approach of, oh man, we have something coming up. We need to put a press release out and we need to get it out to everybody on our media list and hope somebody picks it up. The media That's list, which is out of date probably. Yes. But, it, but you'd be, maybe you wouldn't be surprised how many nonprofits still operate yeah. that way. Well, Peter, um, if somebody speaking of being able to get with an agency and get help, if somebody wants help, how do they find you? Well, uh, my agency is called Turn2 Communications. We're online at turn-two.co. Um, I'm also, uh, you talk about being able to find somebody uh, through social networks. If you Google Google my name, you'll find uh, my LinkedIn profile, my, co my company website, any various different ways to contact us. And if you Google him, it's P-A-N-E-P-E-N-T-O. That's right. <laughs> Panapinto. Also, everyone, the book is available through Amazon. Um, in paper and digital format. Really good read, really practical advice in here. Um, I found some stuff in this book that we will probably use in our for-profit company. Um, it really makes sense the way it's laid out. Um, so go get the book. And Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great to have you on Futures in Fundraising, and we appreciate you sharing this advice with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us, and, and thank you, everybody, who's made it through to the end. Hopefully, it's <laughs> fun to bring Hopefully there's one or two still out there. We'll <laughs> see you next time on the next episode of Futures in Fundraising. <laughs>